Hello and welcome to another virtual program with the Paul Sawyer Public Library. My name is Diane Dahoney. I'm the Community Service Librarian at Paul Sawyer and I'm so thrilled to have you all with us tonight for this very special program. If you have been into the library this month, uh, you have seen the wonderful exhibit uh, in our lobby in the display cases, um, an exhibit called Memento Mori. And uh, this uh, program this evening um, is based on that exhibit. And we are so pleased to have the artist and the poet behind that exhibit here with us. Um, to tell us more about it, to tell us uh, their origin story, um, to do a little bit of reading of the poetry that goes along with the art, um, and to answer your questions. So, um, so pleased to welcome uh, tonight Melissa T. Hall. Melissa is a narrative photographer and artist based in Lexington. Feeling something was missing after starting her career in computer science, she returned to school in Florida to study art and photography. Hall thrives on setting up elaborate photo shoots in dilapidated, abandoned locations. She employs models, vintage clothing, and various props to craft her stories. Her work is completed by combining her photography with encaustic medium and oil paint, and her motivation is to expose the beauty in the midst of ruin. So welcome, Melissa. And we also have with us uh, the poet behind this exhibit, Missy Brownson. Missy resides in Georgetown, Kentucky, and she works as a director of uh, a Frankfurt-based educational organization. Her chat book, Hush Candy, which is fabulous. If you haven't read it, we have it at the library, or um, uh, you can, I believe we have the publisher with us tonight, so we can, we can, uh, tell you where you can pick that up. It's fantastic. It was published by Broadstone Books in 2018, Frankfurt's own Broadstone Books. Brownson, a graduate of Earlham College and participant in the MFA program at Murray State University, didn't begin writing poetry in earnest until 2007 when she returned to her hometown of Owensboro and reconnected with creative leg writing legend David Bartholomew and met poet Kelly Moffat. Do we have, we have Kelly Moffat with us? This is wild. Hello, Kelly. Um, Brownson's work reflects her obsessions with sound and exploring the complexity of women's lived experiences. So please do help me to welcome uh, Melissa T. Hall and Missy Brownson. Hey, everybody. Howdy. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm going to let Melissa start out with, start or do you want to start? Hmm? Let's start, we can start with our origin story. That sounds so, good. So first of all, as uh, Diane mentioned, the publisher, our publisher, Larry Moore is here. He had just published Hush Candy. We didn't even have um, copies available yet. And a friend of mine in, in Louisville who was hosting at an event at Southern Indiana Arts Alliance just had a feeling that my work would correlate well with the artist's work that was going to be displayed that evening. One of those artists was Melissa. And so I saw her work and she heard my words and we just knew that we were meant to be together. Oddly enough, even though Larry had nothing to do with this initial contact with each other. Um, he owns several pieces of Melissa's and even featured one of her pieces at the front of one of the books that he published. So I think it just meant to be. In terms of this project, um, we actually have dual projects. Um, we have Memento Mori, which is exhibited at Public Library. Then we also have Pandemia, which Larry is showing in the Jane Chancellor, which is also in Frankfurt at its free credit union. So if you had the opportunity to look at the this, stuff this, we have on display at the library, you can head over to a free credit union and have a gander at So Melissa, do you wanna share your inspiration for Memento Mori? 
So Memento Mori was the third in a series of, of shows I did surrounding my diagnosis with cancer. Um, so I sort of did in the midst of it, the beginning, the middle, and this was the end. And I was working on this when the pandemic started and I kind of lost all interest in it. Um, I sat at home for about three months with my nose buried in a book or quite a few books. Um, but we had a show to do at the Lexington Art League in Lexington this past spring. And we ended up having twice the amount of space that I originally thought we did, which was terrifying, but perfect. Because we had the work that we'd started with Memento Mori and then we had the extra bit of work that we'd done with the pandemic process. So we ended up just doing two separate shows at the same time. So Memento Mori is Latin for remember you will die. And I, I don't mean that as a study on death, but as a reminder of your mortality to not waste your time, which is pretty much what I've learned in the past five years. Um, so that's, that's what these specific pieces are for me. It's, it's a cautionary tale to, to wake up, to look out, to look around. And it kind of dovetails with the pandemic work to a certain degree too, for, for the same reasons, you know, just don't, don't stay on your couch, you know, <laughs> which is what I was doing. So the way that the process worked was, um, Melissa created her images and she would send me her images. And from there, I would delve into the image. I would ask her a little about what were you thinking when you created this just to kind of hear her take on it but I would I would take it and I would internalize it and then I would create a poem that was in by it um so oh, the way this process Kelly so I'd get the image from Melissa I'd write the poem I'd, I'd text it to Kelly and Kelly would go mm. and so then I would return back to it and then until I got the Kelly stamp of approval um so this was all done, you know, basically when we weren't really, we, we got together a few times, mostly mm -hmm. done the uh, person and then me writing and we ended up with Memento Mori, which was a show at Lexington Art League and now at the library. And there's also um, a book available through Broadstone Books that features, it features the images and the corresponding poetry. Do y'all want to delve into it? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen and um, I'll have an image that Melissa created with the corresponding poem while the image is up on the screen. So let me share the screen. You're gonna see yourselves for a minute to get out. Can everybody see that? And I'll move y'all over here. So you don't have I can. to see it. Okay. Yeah. So this first image, always planning, is one that Melissa finished up after the show at Lexington Artley. You can see this in person at the library. I did not, I do not have a corresponding poem, but I, I plan to, even if there's no purpose other than this image really inspires me. This image, Melissa entitled Acceptance of It All. My corresponding poem is called Rock of Ages. I see boulder. I say stuck. I pray Jesus roll it away. I chisel and split seams, crack and clean, reduce rough stone to pebble, polish smooth, hold in my palm and smile. I consider each exclaim, oh, how they shine. Then rock by rock, stack them to the sky. I see boulder. 
I stay stuck. I pray, Jesus, roll it away. This next image, Melissa entitled, Can't Get It Back. The corresponding poem is entitled, Keeping Time. The measured metronome of middle-class youth, lulled by promise of steady pendulum sway, talk, 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 talk. The teenaged temptation to fast forward, to skip grooves, to smash heirloom hourglass, to press shard against palm, to train for pain. This middle-aged melancholy, its sad attempts to reverse wrinkles, to rewind regret, to shift weight, to slow the ever quickening tick. This image and poem have the same title. Sometimes Melissa and I would, I would take the title that she had created as the title for the poem, or sometimes I would have a title for a poem and she'd say, you know what? I'm gonna use that as the title for the image. Cut the string. Even without the sting of backhand slap or the ring of words that slice, you wear the yoke of yes ma'am. Girl scout rope looped around ankle or slipped around slim wrist, hitched taut, fit to be tied. Cussed the umbilicus, cord long snipped and knotted, yet still sticky, invisible hotline to the one who spun the web you climb, slam and pluck, macrame melee of DNA, strands interwoven, entangled with tales of where the dessert fork goes, how a matching purse matters. Forgive her daughter, forgive her loose ends, frayed and flawed, forged from fear of getting it wrong, right in intentions, but not well. Forgive, but never forget your hands, freckled and fair like hers, are your very own to grasp scissors and stroke cool silver to snap and feel the spring of release. This image is entitled, Do It Anyway. The poem is entitled, For Every Quiver Filled with, fill, field, I'm so Kentucky, For Every Quiver Filled with Fear to Hold Regret. Each decision springs second guess sting, poison pointed arrows loaded with what ifs, sirens sounding doom or worse, mother's disappointment. This image is entitled Every Last One. This poem is entitled My Lover, My Locksmith. I painted myself into corners, red ochre, whisper white, filled hours and beds with distraction of other, locked chambers, atriums and ventricles empty and echoing, but safer that way. Then along came you, your ring full of keys and patience to try every last one to press pins until tumblers gave, to lean steady until walls fell. Let me take a little, little sip here. Melissa's image is entitled, Farewell to Yesterday's Tomorrows. The poem is entitled, my bags are always packed. Tomorrow, I promise the house plant withered leaves left alone too long. Tomorrow, 
I mutter at the mail, mounting drifts of debt, payments pending. Tomorrow, I say to my waistline, doughy and rising, resistant to change. Tomorrow, I hiss at litter boxes, cats protesting, sick of my shit. Tomorrow, I trace in the dust, thick layer, cells forgotten but not lost. Tomorrow, I tell that voice, small but insistent, saying, it's time to go. Melissa's image is entitled, Harder Than It Has To Be. The poem is entitled, We Set Our Own Bait. We have worshiped at shrines of too much and right now, but never enough, not fast enough. We have lived in a cage of marks, invisible tally of shoulds versus dids, pencil pointed punishment. We have loved the sound of springs we set ourselves so well, we never heard the snap of the trap. This image is named Leave No Page Unwritten, which is also the title of the poem. Unfurl sheaves like bed sheets, snap smart and catch wind, fill bellow and release, let fall where they may. Allow wrinkles to rest, discover the secrets in their folds. Tug loose thread, rip stitch against woven resistance. Learn to read Rorschach stains, to cast runes for a ruin, to rejoice in telling. Memento Mori, both of the image and the poem. Think of all the ways you tick away 1,144 minutes each day, counting calories and pills and likes, scrolling, 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 past slant of January sun, howl of wolf moon, green then gold of geeko, you pay no mind. Instead, you stay consumed with what passes for content. Boxes from Amazon filled with romance and mystery, never ending stream of Netflix and chilled Moscato. Mortality curled at your feet, purring, but poised. The title of both the image and the poem is, She Will Never Say, I Can't, I Won't. Instead, she will until she can't, she won't say a word. No matter the weight of wilted daisies, of chipped mug, of dust, the goddamn dust, she will wait. Neck bowed, chin lowered, spine bent until the snap. Cracked and crumbling, home sent tumbling. Let them wonder in her wake of the thing that made her break. Now this image is the one, this whole shebang going. I saw this image of Melissa's and I was like, Wow. So this was the first image for which I wrote a corresponding poem. The title of the image is Tamp It Down. The title of the poem is You Can Run. Go on, girl. Try to lose Jenny. Become Jen with two ends. Pack her deep beneath Flatten that accent to twinge of a twang sprung only when drunk or tired. Flatten those curls too to city slick 
square those shoulders, become angled, steal yourself and train to slip swift through subway doors, to pick a pace, to escape, to scrape off small town. It's shadow, sticky and thick. Now find yourself in your hometown pick pack, air greased with chicken frying, trying to avoid eyes, to find quick the items on your mother's list, buttermilk, brown beans, white onion. Hear your name ring clear down the aisle, turn and burn scarlet, letter Y lilting, lifting the lid on the girl you hid. And this is the final image and poem that we will be sharing this evening. So the title of this image is The Water is Rising. You probably can't see on your screen, but the title of the book that she is holding is called A Field Guide to the Shells. So that's what I have named the poem, A Field Guide to the Shells. Sweet pink mollusk, you were born soft and squalling, already dissatisfied. How small, but how certain, how eager. Early you learned, daughters don't leave. You built your own spine, lined it with pages, took cover, became Ramona, became Nancy, became Sally J. Friedman as herself. Even now, you silence siren, shush call of conch from distant shore, ignore waves lapping against doors. Instead, you become calory, lips curling inward, murmuring, Sunday. I see your little silent claps, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing the poems and and the the pieces, ladies. Um, can we just open it up to questions and discussion? You think does that work for you guys? Okay, sure. All right. Well, uh, feel free to unmute yourself, or if you're bashful, you can always put your question or your comment in the chat. Um, but we would love to hear from you if you are comfortable with that. So. Anybody want to start us off? Okay, I will then. I got plenty of questions. Go ahead. I got plenty of questions, but I don't want to hog it. Fabulous. So I'll just, I'll rank them in order. I mean, I, I know what ekphrastic means, but, and, I, and I've known Missy for a long time. Melissa, I don't know you, so I, but. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just curious because I think the way that I understand the definition of ekphrastic means that you write a poem to an image. But if you take it more punk, have you ever done it the other way? Ooh, we have not. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. I like that. Mm -hmm. I like that. But something I, I would like to explore. I know that when I was shooting for the pandemic work, I bounced a lot of ideas off of Missy and we kind of worked that way for that project. But, but in the future, we could definitely go the other direction as well. And I do have to say that's been one of that in, in the midst of such a difficult time with the pandemic, this was such a wonderful escape to be able to kind of go on those little flights with Nancy with Melissa and talk through some of our creative ideas together. So then just as a quick follow-up, um, uh, Melissa, I don't know, do you, do you shoot only still or do you shoot video as well? I have never done video. I, um, it took me so long to get to the point where I felt like I could get everything I wanted in one image video is almost terrifying to me. Well, I find that interesting because to me, I, I'm, 
uh, you tell me. I'm, I'm just curious about the fact that it seems like the state of still photography now is almost very constrained by news and news sources. I think it depends on the photographer. You don't see a lot of sort of artistic work, at least not the way it used to be 20 years ago, versus True. video work, which seems to be expounding. I'll definitely agree with that. Um, and I think it depends on the photographer. I know that my focus and, and my muse is very internal. It's not, the pandemic is actually the first time I used current events to, to process and, and shoot. So for me, it's, it's not so much current events and what's going on usually, even, even with the pandemic work, it was my interpretation of how I was dealing with it or how I saw other people dealing with it. So I, I think, you know, and I'm middle-aged now, so I think probably younger people gravitate toward video. You, the, the technology is so different now than it was when I started out. Well, that's part of why I was asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. May, it's, may, I, may, may I make an observation uh, to, uh, specifically to Boyd's comment? Because um, this show at the library is not officially part of the Louisville Photo Biennial. Uh, Melissa and Missy's show that's currently on at the Jane Chancellor Moore Gallery is, but uh, to Boyd's observation uh, that seemed to suggest that still photography uh, is confined or restricted in any way, I would invite anyone who thinks that to take a look at the 60 plus venues currently participating in the Louisville Photo Biennial, which is all about fine art still photography in its many, many forms. So um, Melissa oh, is, yeah, boy. Is, is a great exponent. <laughs> of well, well first, first, first of all, I didn't, I didn't mean that as a negative comment. I just I didn't felt that. like in my experience up here in New York, it seems like just the world is shrinking for still photography. And I just want, my question was whether, whether you felt that way as well. I think mm -hmm. uh, point that was just made was that I'm not correct about that, which is excellent because I don't want to, I, no, I don't want it to shrink. I like still photography. I just, I just didn't know. As someone, cause I don't do it. I just wondered from someone who actually does or, you know, make that sort of thing, whether mm -hmm. you had the same impression. I don't really feel like, I, I feel like with more opportunities, both, both in, in technology and, and, just opportunity in general, I think things become more dispersed. So there's just more out there. So it may look like there's not as much fine art photography going on, but there's just so much to see. Well, I think that's, I mean, a little bit supply and demand as well, right? Sure. If there's, if there's too much, but it's not good. Oh, that's always the case. Right, then, then it capital, it, you know, you, you wind up concentrating at the top with a few number of artists who are outsized mm -hmm. and then lots of individual people who can't, can't, you know, shove in. Oh, sure. Melissa, that so it's, I don't think it's as evident for, you can't see it in these images because you're not seeing them in person, but I think it would be, I, I would love for you to share your process when you are creating these images, whenever you see them in person, they are so deep and so textured that it goes beyond a photograph or the Photoshop uh, magic that Melissa has done. So would you share a little bit about your process? Sure. Um, what Missy is alluding to is I take my finished photos and for shows, I make a large 24 by 36 piece or larger and I mount them on cradled birch board and then I paint on top of that with encaustic medium, which is beeswax and Damar resin. So you paint with it heated, you fuse every layer and I put five or six base coats on and, and add my texture to it. And then I paint on top with oil paint. So when you see the piece in person, you get a depth that you don't always get with photography, which I love because it gives, the wax gives the light a chance to bounce around and you get these, these layers, actual and 
physical presence as opposed to like Photoshop layers, which is also important because that's the first part of my process. Does that make sense? Sounds almost like batik. A little bit, um, except you're not, <laughs> you, there's, there's no, when well, you can scrape into it, so you can excavate into it. I don't typically do that. I'm more of an additive person. <laughs> Um, I've got a question. Um, my question is too, I, I understand that you use old buildings as your setting. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, do you already have in mind the message or the image that you want to do? And then you try to find the space, the building that matches that, or do you go, do you find the place and then the imagery of that place presents itself and that's what gives you the inspiration for what you do or is it maybe a combination of both it is definitely a combination of both sometimes the location will spark the idea or i'll have a general idea and then things will get really specific when i see the location so the last image that missy showed the one with the the water is rising the room I had gone to look at the location before I did my shoot and noticed this little sailboat on top of the fireplace. And that's what got water into my head. I had the rest of the idea. Yeah, that one. <laughs> I had, had the rest, I, I'd had parts of the idea and I saw that sailboat and I couldn't get water out of my head. And I'm like, okay, let's just put the room underwater. So, definitely locations spark ideas and then sometimes like missy will you show the attic one the um she will never say one more up one more that one that is a house in lexington i have a thing for attics if you haven't noticed it became a white box challenge for me and i was shocked at how many ideas i could just fill this white void with so in that instance, I brought the ideas to the location and was certainly amazed by the light and, and what could be done in that confined space. That was a good question. Well, I was gonna say too, of, of the, the artwork that I've seen at the Pulsary Library, and I did all actually uh, go to the one at, at Excre as well, hmm. but my, my absolute favorite is the always planning. And I love that imagery and everything. For some reason, it really resonates with me. And I think what it is, is that there's an optimism about it that, mm -hmm. you know, she's looking um, outward, um, you know, towards the future or, or whatever, but then she's still tethered mm -hmm. by the weight of of where she is and and it seems like the best laid plans you know no matter what type of uh creative endeavor or whatever that you want to do whether it's writing or art that you know you still have to deal with the minutiae of the everyday existence that keeps you tied down that keeps you from getting to everything that you really want to do or the freedom that you want to have to do it. But I, I just, I really love that that image. I really, that's just my favorite. So thank you a lot to it, so. And amen, <laughs> sister, on your comments about everyday life keeping you tethered to, yes. Yeah, so definitely. That's, so much. that's, that was exactly what I was thinking yeah. when that image came to be. So um, Lane, since that's her favorite, um, could you all uh, let us know which, uh, which image is your favorite and which poem is your favorite? And are they a pair or, or not? I'll share the screen and kind of scroll through them just as a reminder. I'll start while you're doing that. I can tell you which one is my favorite. And it's still the first one, Tamp It Down. Not the image, but the poem. I didn't give Missy much more than the title. And she sent this amazing 
piece of work to me. And I just was gobsmacked because my, my muse for this was very different, but I grew up in West Virginia, so I'm a hillbilly. And what she wrote just, I felt like she was reaching into my soul and pulling something out. It was amazing to me. And I think, I mean, this, this is, this image, I can't even speak about it. It speaks so much to me, but I think this is definitely one of my favorite images. It's the one that I really just felt so compelled to get started with. But I have to say, I think in terms of a image poetry pair, cut the string. Um, I think the poem itself um, is probably the most meaningful to me. Uh, it's interesting because um, Melissa and I just did an event at Expri at the Moore Gallery a week ago. And I so I asked a couple of my friends who were going to be there. I was like, do you have any requests, you know? <laughs> Um, and both of them, women, requested um, to hear Cut the Stirring. So I think it's something, you know, it's got some mother issue stuff in there. And I think a lot of women can probably relate to that. Boy, howdy. I went back to my hometown to shoot that one. It's in an old abandoned um, office building where I used to go with my grandmother to get her hair cut. <laughs> I do have a thing for addicts. Can you tell? Was this, this one was also in the office building, wasn't it? Was. Yeah. Love the paneling. <laughs> I think, I think that one, if you go back one. Um, this one? Uh, that, the one that you have the, yes, that one. Okay. I think that's really interesting too, because um, you know, of course, the, the woman in the black representing death, you know, I, I think, you know, standing behind her, getting ready to tap her on the shoulder, that type of thing. But it's interesting, too, because of the room, because you would you would have thought that the the wall would have been inverted. In other words, the decaying wall would have behind would have been behind the woman in black. And and the woman in white would have had like the nicer wall behind her, but that it was switched. And I thought that was interesting because um, because even even though she's in the in the present and everything, there's still the decay is still around. It's just that she has she has not gotten involved into it. Does that make sense? Like, I just think it was neat that you put the black dress in front of the nicer wall <laughs> I, I don't know there's there something it. more to that or whatever I just I just thought that that was neat how that was composed like that I love that take on it it more for me the the locations especially like these that are kind of crumbling sort of symbolize my dissatisfaction with my life to a certain degree. And that's pretty much why I think I'm drawn to those. And I don't, I don't, dissatisfaction is a harsh word, but eh, sometimes. <laughs> I, I, didn't re I didn't read that as death. Really? How did you read it? I read it as divorce. Oh, that's interesting. Because I read the other one as bride. And, and probably, you know, it should, you know, I guess if that's going to be bride, it could have been a little whiter, less pink, but mm -hmm. I, that's, I mean, or maybe it's just, I don't know, Missy too well, but I just figured that the, the person tapping on the shoulder was like, guess what, lady? That is a cool take on it. I did intend it to be death. All um, right, fair enough. 
but that's but I that's what I love when other people view my work. I love when they have a totally different interpretation. I mean, I know she's got a skull in her hat, but that's not. Oh. <laughs> but she's got a book in her hand too, so it's like that. To me, that's not necessarily life and death. That's like I'm getting married, and now it's like, guess what? And that's what I love. These images become Rorschach tests for people, and I well, absolutely yeah. well, guilty. Guilty as charged. <laughs> I have a question for Missy. E. Uh, as I, I've in previous opportunities have, have expressed what a fine job I think she's done of ekphrastic writing uh, in this series, uh, just really some exemplary ekphrastic writing. But my sense is that that's a fairly new poetic genre, uh, Missy. So what is your background with ekphrastic writing that you brought to, to this work? Um, I wrote one ekphrastic poem in undergrad, <laughs> so I really don't have a lot of experience uh, with ekphrastic poetry. What was poetry. it? Huh? What was it? I'll share it. I mean, it was it was inspired um, by um, oh, La Lectrice is the name of the image. I'll share. I can share that um, later. It was uh, Dolly. Dolly image. But anyway, and I have Hank the cat in my lap, so he's meowing. So please forgive the meowing that's corresponding with this. Um, but, you know, Lane had talked about that difficulty of the everyday life and how it competes for your, your time and your creativity. And, you know, I work a full-time job. I have a full life and, um, sometimes it's hard to make that space and find that space that allows you to slip into that creative mode. Um, and so with Melissa's images, and I think also with the deadlines that were associated with them, because we had two shows that were getting ready to go up at Lexington Art League, it really enabled me to have that creative space and slip into those images and really be transported to a different place. So I, you know, I think Melissa and I are planning on doing future collaborations. I know that she's been working on some images. Who knows? Like Boyd suggested, I have some things that she for which she is creating images. But I think for me, it's been a really wonderful collaboration in that the inspiration is already provided. How was um, the process of creating this um, this exhibit? Um, how did it differ from creating Pandemia? Or were you working on them at the same time? Was one easier than the other? Let's see, you wanna go first? Do you want me to go first? Well, you did the super hard work of like creating the whole ideas and the images and stuff. I just responded to them. <laughs> yeah, but I can't write. So I think you did the hard work. Um, well, and let me, well, if you want to start, Melissa, I'll pull up some of the pandemia images so that people can oh, okay. get an idea of what we're talking about. For me, um, it was kind of the same process, different different muse. So I had been going through shooting these images before the pandemic started and kind of just dropped everything and then started shooting the, the pandemic stuff as, as the ideas started to come to me and I got access to locations. Um, the, and then there was just a mad rush to process everything all at the same time, which was kind of nuts. Normally I don't do that much work at one time. And, and these have been the most ambitious in Photoshop that I've ever done before. There were some, I know, I know Missy was biting her nails because she'd written great work. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm gonna get this work done or not. <laughs> so there were some like the, the water is rising. That was one of the last ones I did. It ended up being, it, it, I learned some new things in Photoshop. I stretched my skills 
so it's all good but this was uh, a little scary to get the work done this is the oh, first nice. time I've done work for a space like i i chose I, I chose sizes and numbers based on the exact space. So that was a new experience for me, which was kind of, it was, it was hard, but it was fun at the same time. So these are the, the images from the pandemic work, the pandemia. And this all started when I bought this acrylic globe and the ideas just started flowing from that one prop. And so um, I'll be honest. So we had, we knew we were doing the Memento Mori show. And so I was working on those poems, um, which were more my standard style of writing. So then we had this additional space that we had access to at Lexington Art League. And so I was like, oh my goodness. Now I have all these other poems to write. And if they were going to be the same length as the Memento Mori poems, well, I just didn't know what I was going to do. So what I ended up doing was I employed a form called the Tonka, which I've also referred to as the grown-up. I think it was you, Boyd. You're the one who said grown-up haiku. I get to give you the credit. So instead of the, the haiku, which is the 575, um, three line, 575 syllables, the Tonka is actually five lines it's uh five seven five seven seven syllable pattern. oh no i just to be clear i did not do that you did you called it no, a grown-up no I don't, I don't i don't think i did <laughs> so um what i would like to do is i'll just really quickly read you one of these um i'm gonna read this one because it is like is this image just I, birds are creepy anyway um this one just totally creeped me out but this, just an example, this is the Tonka that I wrote uh, for Coming Home to Roost. And none of these have titles. So for Coming Home to Roost, I wrote, Worst fears come to roost. Oil slick ebony, taloned and taunting, kind. So who is the caged one now? Nobody likes a show off. So you can see it's it's very short and this I think this is probably I, I kept showing uh, my husband pictures I'm like this is my favorite one no this is my favorite one but I really think that other one was one of my favorites of the pandemia show and I think this one is probably my other so no end in sight best laid plans gone gray cobwebbed calendar keeping count X's and oh no, not that. Each page seeping rubber stamped red. Canceled, closed. And so I really, the thing that I really in, enjoyed about this exercise, it was a challenge um, with the Tonkas and, and having that economy of language and only being able to use so many syllables per line, it really makes you pay attention to the words that you are choosing. Once again, I have to give a shout out um, to Kelly on that one, because she would be, she would get uh, texts with Tonkas. <laughs> and then I'd realize, oh crap, that one has an extra syllable and have to start over again. But, and it was a joy to receive them. It was a joy. <laughs> I just want to say that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so Missy, when you were sending these uh, poems, when they were in, in the works, um, were you sending the image or, or, what you had of the image at that point um, with them uh, when you had folks read those for you? Or were they just reading the poem alone? For the Tonkas, I sent the images more often um, for the Memento Mori, because I feel like I feel like those poems are more reliant on the image. For the Memento Mori, it was really important for me that they stand alone. So Kelly would get some, Boyd would get some. And so I'd be like, here's the poem and then here's the image and so, yeah, I wanted I, more than the Tonkas, which are very much part of the pandemic, I wanted those Memento Mori poems to be able to stand on their own if there was no image involved. Um, I do want to make question. sure everybody knows um, the Memento Mori exhibit that's at the library um, will, will be there until the end of the month. Um, so if you haven't had time to stop by and see it, 
Um, or even if you have, and you uh, after you've uh, been with us tonight and have been thinking about it all again, and you want to come back and see it, I encourage you to do that uh, to share um, share it with your friends and your family and have them uh, come take a look. Um, but can you remind us how long the exhibit will be, the pandemia exhibit will be at the Moore Gallery? Um, and can you let folks know where that is in case they really enjoyed the exhibit at the library and they want to go check out uh, the other one? I'll let you handle that, Larry. You know the answers <laughs> related to that. Okay, the uh, pandemia show is at the Jane Chancellor Moore Gallery, which is located off the main lobby of Expree Credit Union at 100 Moore Drive in Frankfort, Kentucky. That's uh, just off the east-west connector uh, at the end of Martin Luther King Boulevard to kind of orient you to, uh, to that part of, of, the, of the highway there. Uh, the show will be up officially through the first week of November, uh, which is the uh, conclusion of the Louisville Photo Biennial. Um, and it's interesting because I haven't quite had the conversation yet with Melissa about exactly when we're going to swap shows out. So I would say if you want to be absolutely sure that you get to see the Pandemia show and you should uh, try to get in there in the next two weeks because it will be up at least through the first full week of November. Diane, I want to, Kelly had something to say. I just wanted to give her. Oh, absolutely. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Oh, no, I was just going to ask a question, and I think we're almost out of time. I was just really interested because of this project. Um, what language taught you about the image, Melissa? And then with Missy, what did the image teach you about language? Spoken like a true creative writing professor. <laughs> um what the image taught me about language. I think for me, the process was really examining the image and pulling things out or focusing on things just like with the water image, focusing on that field guide to the shells. It was a matter of looking at the image and really seeing the details. And Larry, you sh we had a reading um, at the gallery at Chancellor Moore, Chancellor Moore Gallery. And he said something about how, you know, it's not just a matter of reporting what you see in the image. It's a matter of being inspired by that image because I didn't want it to be, you know, well, there's a lady and, a, and there's a bunch of suitcases and her arms sticking out. There's an arm sticking out of the bottom one. You know, it's, it's taking that image and seeing where you can go with it and where it goes in your brain and then pulling out those little details to describe those. For me, I have no creative skill where writing is concerned at all. So when each new poem or tonka would show up, it was like Christmas for me, that, that something I had done had sparked this creative outflow in, in a form that I appreciate, but cannot do it all. <laughs> so it was just kind of pure joy for me. I was, I was kind of curious too about um, when I look at the, the images and everything too, um, it almost has kind of a dreamlike uh, feel to it. And I was just, and, and there's also a lot of, um, almost like dream interpretation to it. And I was just wondering if, if, you were, if you were also interested in like dream images or dream um, symbolism and that type of thing, because I, I, especially the use of houses and windows and such, mm -hmm. uh, I was just wondering if, if that was also an interest of yours as well and that that's what's incorporated in your work. I would say definitely that is my language to a certain degree creatively at this point. I don't think that I started there, but I think it got incorporated as I learned and as I played and as I created. Um, love symbolism, love. I strive to make an image that has a little mystery to it. 
because if you spell everything out, it's boring. So if there's room for interpretation, if there's room for questioning, if there are surprises you can pick out, then I feel like I've done a good job. So, and, and I love fantasy science fiction. <laughs> so I think I was kind of bent that way anyway. And Melissa, I think that space that you put in there, you know, that that speaks to what you were envisioning as death is what Boyd was envisioning as divorce, what you were envisioning with your tamp it down image. You know, there a million poets could write a million different poems and they would each have it take something different away from your images, I think. I love that. That always makes me happy. Sorry, I was muted. Um, I think Rebecca has a question in the chat. Um, she says she loves farewell to yesterday's tomorrow. Are you selling prints? Um, and she thinks that she saw that one differently than the uh, accompanying poem. I would love to hear how, is she still on here? I see you. Rebecca, are you able to share, are you willing to share how you saw it differently? I, I have to go back to uh, the language you had probably to do it, but as you were reading it, I did. So how I see the photo is it rem what it said to me was don't hold on to what you thought tomorrow was going to be yesterday yes let it go i'm sorry yes yes that's what and but i didn't hear that in the poem but i heard that's how i saw it and i loved it um because it just spoke to so much i in my life in life yeah you saw it the way i i saw it because it was a meditation on cancer and that my life was now different than I expected it would be. So that's exactly my interpretation as opposed to Missy's. So are, do you sell prints? I, I was oh, looking at your yeah, website sorry. trying to figure that out. Um, um, yeah. I currently have a batch of prints at Larry's gallery. Okay. Jane, more gallery. Um, but you can always contact me directly um, through Facebook or What's the easiest way to get to me? It comes right down to it. Um, yeah, actually, yes. Missy just posted my website. Um, there's definitely a link to get to me through my website as well. MelissaTHall.com. So yes, definitely. Now, are, um, are the books um, available at the gallery too? Or um, are they only available for purchase through Broadstone's website? They're through Broadstone's website, and I'm putting that at link in the chat right now. Um, there, there's a book available for Memento Mori, and there's also a book available for Pandemia. And so these include both the images and the poems. And thank you to Larry for putting those together for us. Thank you. We call it our mad science projects. Yeah. <laughs> when the three of us get together, you just never know. <laughs> <clears throat> Did anyone else have a question or a comment? Well, I have a question too. Will you be doing more presentations or do you have more? Um, I didn't know if you all were gonna be involved with the Kentucky Book Fair or are you going to be doing presentations in other locations? see you want to take that one we can you know if, if people are clamoring for presentations i imagine we can we can pull them together so if you know of any opportunities i think we would be open to that um we won't be at kentucky book fair i got to be there a few years ago with hush candy thankfully um but not this year it's, i love kentucky book fair though I'm already off to my next project. I'm off next week to go do a photo shoot. So I, I can't sit still. So what is but your next project? I'm, my 
father is getting ready to sell my grandmother's house and I'm sad, but I don't want to move back to West Virginia. <laughs> so I am using that as my location to explore. Okay. This is convoluted. Stay with me. <laughs> I've had a title in the back of my head for years, but without the idea for a show, which is the opposite of any other time I've ever done this. So my mother was a librarian for a while and she would get mad at me if I would crack the spine of a book when I was reading it. I mean, she just hated that. So I had the idea for a show, Mind the Spine, A Small Act of Rebellion. I'm taking, she passed away six years ago. I'm taking her books and I'm using them for collage. So I'm tearing them up. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also doing a photo shoot exploring my mother, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, exploring their rebellions in their lives in, in a spot that I'm calling the scene of the crime. <laughs> so that's my next project. And I'm sure Missy and I will be talking quite a bit about that. That sounds right up my alley. Like, I'm so excited that you just said that. I mean, you knew I was going to get excited about that. So <laughs> you this must one, keep yeah. me in the loop. Oh, definitely. I do worry <laughs> about something this intensely personal if other people will pick up on it or not. But I've decided since Missy, the way Missy picked up on, on my work, that I'm just not going to worry about it. I'm just going to do my work and let, let it it's fly. personal it is much more universal than you would ever could ever imagine it's just like the poems that I wrote for Hush Candy were very personal but mm -hmm. I think when you when you tap into that other people are able to tap into those those experiences and those parts of themselves so I think you, it feels really personal because it is personal yeah. but I think you'll find that it's really universal yeah that's the hope all right well, thank you all so very much uh, for joining us tonight. Um, this has been a wonderful discussion. Uh, thank you to Melissa and Missy for sharing your work with us. Um, it's so beautiful, so touching. I have thoroughly enjoyed this month. Every chance I get um, going into our lobby and like kind of lurking and seeing who's who's looking at the who's looking at the exhibit and just watching them take it in. Um, we've gotten so many wonderful comments. Um, everyone's really enjoying it and relating to it, like you were just saying. Um, so if you haven't had the chance to come down, please do that. Um, 319 Wapping Street. Um, and um, if you have and you, you wanna come back and see us again, we'd love to have you. Um, and I hope that you'll have a chance to go out to uh, the Jane Chancellor Moore Gallery and check out Pandemia as well. Um, but thank you again uh, to Melissa and Missy, and thank you all for joining us. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful evening, and I hope that you will join us uh, for another program very soon. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you all. Love all y'all. And Diane, thank you. You're most welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for the presentation. Really enjoyed Thank it. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We can meet in person sometime. <laughs> Thank y'all. Thank you.